OK, so let's talk about forces. First question, what is force? Right? I'm pretty sure you have some uh, experience with the forces. You apply forces all the time, right? When you pick something, when you uh, move something, you're applying forces on it. So the question is, what is a force? Anybody? What is the definition of a force? It's the change of speed applied to an object. The change of speed is basically acceleration. So he's trying to relate forces with the acceleration. And of course, you always have some inertia in the object, so that plays a role too. Heavier the object is, less acceleration it will have. Right? We all understand that. So what he's talking about is, you know, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Right? Any other definitions? It's something that either causes or restricts the movement of an object. It causes or restricts the movement of an object, sure enough. That's a good way of putting it qualitatively. Any other definition of the force? Sorry? Amount of work being done? Not quite so. Amount of work being done is a different quantity altogether. Work has a different unit, has a different dimension. It, has, it's, it is related to the force, but it is not exactly the work done, right? You will learn pretty soon that work is defined as a dot product between force and the displacement, which often simplifies to force times displacement, as long as both of them are in the same direction, but not in general. So how many of you think that the definition of the force is mass times acceleration? And don't be afraid to you know, raise your hand. It's OK. I won't judge you guys. So if you think force is mass times acceleration, raise your hand. No, it's, it's OK. Yeah. So that's what I thought. Most of you probably think that force, definition of the force is mass times acceleration. Well, actually, that's not really true. You may have learned that definition maybe in your high school physics classes. But definition of the force is not mass times acceleration. Force equal to mass times acceleration is a relationship. OK? That relationship does not define what a force is. Just as you are not defined by your relationship with your parents, or your relationship with your friends, or with your girlfriend, or you know anybody else in the world, right? You are who you are. So if I said, hey, tell me your name. Brian, Brian define yourself. How would you define yourself? Uh, just by like, who I am? I don't yeah, know. yeah, who, who you are, right? Will you say, hey, I'm defined by, you know, my parents are, you know, Mr. John Galt and Mrs. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Gold, yeah, something like that. How would you define yourself? Anybody? How do you define yourself? Tell me your name. Hasla. Hasla. How would you define yourself? I talk about myself, different characteristics. Okay, you'll talk about yourself, different characteristics. Okay, that's good. Vincent. Vincent. How would you define yourself? Vincent. Vincent. Just by the name. <laughs> well, that doesn't tell me much, right? I mean, you could be Mr. X. Uh, would it tell me anything if you just told me the name? So. So, so you guys are right. You, know, you can't define something by the relationship. It has to have an intrinsic definition for something, right? So force have to have an intrinsic definition. Could be defined by the characteristics, right? Could be defined by the interaction, but it is not defined by a relationship. So F equal to M A, which is the Newton's second law, I'm sure most of you know, is not the definition for the force. So what is a force? Well, force we all know qualitatively is a push or a pull, right? Certain things can be pushed, certain things can be pulled. If you take a rope, you can pull the rope, but can you push the rope? You can, right? So you can apply the tensile load on it, but you can apply compressive load on it. So certain things can be pushed, certain things can be pulled, and they're all characterizing an interaction, right? So that's qualitatively put, but that doesn't define what a force is. So the definition of force is variable. There is no single universal definition for force. Definition of the force depends on the material interaction. Because force is nothing but an interaction between two objects. Now, the definition of the force will depend on what is the nature of that interaction. So let's say I talk about myself. OK? I'm standing here. What is my interaction with the floor of this classroom? So I'm pushing down on the floor, right? I'm pushing down on the floor. If this, if this floor was made of a very weak material, you know, I probably would go down, right? Because I would apply a lot of load on the, on the uh, floor. So I'm pushing down on the floor, right? What is floor doing on me? It's pushing me up. So force is pushing me up. That's what you were going to say, right? So force is pushing me up. 
So that's my interaction with the floor. Am I interacting with anything else in this world? Air? Why am I here? Why am I not, why am I not flying? Gravity. So the gravitational pull of the Earth is pulling me down, right? It's pulling me down. So my interaction with the, with the gravitational uh, system of the Earth is of one kind of interaction. It's one kind of force, and that's the gravitational force. So it's pulling me down. So gravity is a kind of force. Now, if let's say you know, I was walking, I would be interacting with the floor in another way too. So it's supporting me at the same time I need friction to walk, right? So that's another interaction. Now, what is that force? What is that friction force? What would it depend on? What is its value? So interaction will define what the force is. If I took, let's say, you know, maybe there was a spring over here or, or maybe an exercise equipment with a spring on it and I was pulling on it, I'll be applying a force on the spring. So my interaction with the spring would be such that I will be pulling the string, uh, I'll be pulling the spring and the spring will be pulling me in the opposite direction. But then the question is, what is the force on the spring? And that depends on what that interaction is. So definition of the force depends on the nature of the interaction, which means it has to be a variable one. Right? So as long as you know, if you don't know the, the nature of the interaction, you cannot tell what the definition is. But force is never defined by this relationship. Okay? That's the thing that you need to remember from today's lecture. Because when you get to dynamics, I will ask this question again. Okay, so force is a vector quantity, right? Which means that we can resolve it along x and y direction as long as the force is in the xy plane, and I will be able to write something like this. By the way, this is a cartoon that one of the Mech 101 students from this class drew last year for me. I hired her. She was a great, she's a great uh, illustrator, so I hired her to do some of the drawings for my class. So you'll see some of these pencil sketches uh, drawn by her, and you know, it's quite amazing that a mechanical engineering student uh, is able to do this kind of sketching. I really liked uh, her sketches. Okay. And that girl, by the way, looks a little bit like her. So you can probably, you know, find out who she is. Okay, so we talked about addition of the vectors, right? Let's see if we can do something similar with the forces. Forces are vectors, so it's easy to do them. So if I have a force of 5 Newton applied on something and a 10 Newton force applied uh, in another direction, if I want to add them together, all I have to do is write each of these two forces along x and y direction and add them together. So along x direction, the component of f would be f cosine 45, so that's cosine 45 is 1 over root 2, so we get that. And y component of this would be uh, 5 over root 2, so we get that right over here. And then this component, 10 newton, is entirely along j hat, so we have 10, uh, well this, should, this is wrong, this should be 10 j hat. So let me make that correction. So this should not be 10 i hat, this should be uh, 10 j hat, right? So this is the part that represents this force of 5 Newton, and this is the part that represents this force of 10 Newton. So how do you add them together? We have I hat component over here, and that will be itself, and then we have the J hat component, so we'll add these two numbers, and we'll get the, the total force, right? Okay, this is an example from your textbook, this is example 4.1, this is called an I bolt, and this I bolt has, you can see, you know, three cables, there could be steel cables, and they are basically being pulled, okay? So there's this force of tension in the cable, and the three forces that are acting on this I bolt are 800 pound that way, 350 pound that way, and 150 pound uh, in that way, right? Now what we want to do is, we want to add these three forces. So how do we add forces? Forces are vector. If we can write each of those three forces in terms of I hat and J hat, unit vectors and some magnitude, we can add them together. So we need to pick a reference frame. So let's say this is the reference frame we are picking, right? So x axis is pointing towards the right, y axis is pointing up, and i hat and j hat are the unit vectors. So when somebody says, please add these forces, and you're going to do it using Cartesian representation, you need to draw the quarter frame. This is the most important thing. If you don't draw this quarter frame, then we don't know which way your i hat are pointing, which way your j hat are pointing, right? Okay, so how do we add them? Let's first do the force F1. Force F1 is the 800 pound. It's making an angle of 45 degree, right, from Y axis, which means this is also 45. So if I were to resolve F1, I'll get 800 times cosine 45 and 800 times sine 45 along X and Y direction. 
and that's this number, right? 350, this is 20, so that's cosine 20 along y direction and minus sine 20 towards negative x direction, so we get that, right? Now, some of you may be in the habit of writing a vector by measuring the angle it makes from the positive x-axis, okay? And that's also okay, so if you measure your angles from the positive x-axis, then you don't have to worry about seeing which way they are really pointing, okay? All you have to do is, if this length is, let's say, f, then all you have to do is say f cosine theta i hat plus f sine theta j hat, and because theta is more than 90 degree, the cosine and sine will take care of the sines, so you won't have to worry about the sine. The other way is, you do what we are doing over here, you look at the actual angle it is making from x and y axis, and then resolve it along those direction. Finally, F3 is entirely along negative x direction, so that's minus i hat, and the length is 150. So now all you have to do is collect all the i hat terms, and collect all the j hat terms, and you get your final answer, which would be something fx plus i hat plus fy j hat. To get the magnitude, you square them, add them together, do the square root, to get the angle, you do this, but of course, be careful about this. Why? Because you need to see where this vector is, which quadrant this vector is in. If it is in the first quadrant, then it's not a problem. You can just divide them. If it is not in the first quadrant, then you will need to see where it is. So now the question is, we understand what forces are, right? But is that sufficient? It is not sufficient because if you want to rotate something, you need more than forces. Right? So you guys probably entered the classroom when you came in. Did anybody try to push on the hinges to get in if the door was closed? Have you ever tried that? Maybe when you were a kid, right? You were curious. Why can't I push on the hinges and open the door? You can't, right? So clearly you could apply as much force as you wanted on the hinges, but there's no way you'll be able to open the door. Right? If you are trying to use a screwdriver to, let's say, tighten or, or, or loosen a nut or a bolt or a screw, you know that if you're force that you're applying on the, on the uh, nut is far away from the axis of rotation, you have a much easier time opening or tightening something, right? You know, you guys, most of you probably drive a car or have some experience at least sitting in the car and trying to drive it. I have a two and a half year old son. He tries to do that all the time because he likes to drive cars. So he sits with me in, in my garage and, you know, he just tries to do. Anyway, so, so you guys drive a car, right? Now, if somebody said, you know what, I'm going to give you a steering wheel, but that is steering wheel is going to be really this is small. What would you say? Well, now you'll be probably muttering unspeakable under your breath, right? So it's not going to work. So clearly, it's not the forces alone that will make something rotate. If you want to rotate something, you need more than forces. And what is that quantity? So we have a physical quantity for that, which we call moment or the torque, okay? So torque is usually a word we reserve for the moment that the shaft of an engine or a motor applies on a load. So we won't really use the word torque when we're talking about the moment. We, the moment we start talking about the DC motors and engines later on in the semester, we will say, hey, this is the torque that this motor can apply, okay? But moment and torque basically are otherwise same things, okay? It's just different uh, uh, context where we use those two words. So how do we capture this notion that you need the force and you also need a little bit of distance from the axis of rotation or the pivot point? right, about which you want to rotate something. The definition of the moment is really very simple, okay? This is the simplified definition, which says that the moment is defined by the force, the magnitude of the force that you're applying, times the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the point of interest. Okay, let's see what that means. So first of all, magnitude of the force, we understand that, right? How much push or pull you're applying. What is the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the point of interest? Line of action is basically nothing but the direction a force acts. So in this case, if you apply this force F in this direction, that line along which this force is acting is called line of action because force is like an action, okay? Then D is the perpendicular distance from the point of interest, which is, which is most of the time is the pivot point or axis of rotation to this line of action. So if this is the pivot point because you're trying to rotate this knot, then perpendicular distance would be, uh, the perpendicular distance would be the distance from this point and you draw a line that will be perpendicular to this line of action, and that's this line, right? So that would be the D, okay? So that's the definition of the moment. Now, later on, you will see that you'll have a much more rigorous definition for the moment. In this class, we are mostly dealing with the force and the moments, everything in a plane, 
right? When you get into the three-dimensional objects where you try to compute the moment, you will be better off using a proper definition that involves cross product of a position vector with the force. So if anybody is in the status class, you probably learned the definition of moment as R cross F, right? And this definition is a simplified version of R cross F, F. okay? So because in a plane, we really don't need to worry about the cross product. We can, we can just multiply the perpendicular distance with the force, and we can figure out which direction the moment is going to be acting. And I'll show you that in the next slide, how to figure out the direction part, all right? So, so that's the basic definition, force times perpendicular distance, right? And sometimes that perpendicular distance is also called the lever arm distance, okay? So longer lever arm you have, more moment you can apply with the same force, okay? All right, so let's look at a few examples. So in this case, we have a hand that's trying to maybe screw this knot or try going to unscrew this knot, right? So we want to compute the moment due to this force, right? So what is a moment? Moment would be this force magnitude, whatever it is, right? So how do we write that? We put the bars around the force vector, and that tells you that's the scalar quantity, times the perpendicular distance. So do a little bit of trigonometry. If this length, the distance from here to here is L, and if this angle is theta, right, then this is a right angle triangle, so this would be? L cosine theta, right? So the moment is L cosine theta times the magnitude of F, okay? All right, that's good. So we can compute the moment due to this force. Now, another way to compute the moment is by using the component method. And both of these methods are discussed in your textbook. So first method that I just spoke about is called perpendicular distance method. The second method is component method. So what is component method? Really very simple idea. We already know that if we have a force in a plane, we can resolve it along component direction, Cartesian axis directions. Right? We can always break it down into two components. So if we pick a quadrant system, right, and in that quadrant system we resolve this force along two perpendicular directions, then I can also write the moment of this force by computing the moment of the two component forces. Right? So how can I resolve this force F? Well, let's say this is my you know one axis, okay? And this is my other axis, right? So this is perpendicular to this line, essentially. And I, I've just picked that, okay? So if this angle is theta, then this, would be, this component would be F cosine theta, and this component would be F sine theta. So now instead of trying to compute the moment of this force by looking at the perpendicular distance, I can look at the moment of these two quantities alone, and then add them up. Okay, so what is the moment of F cosine theta? Well, the moment of F cosine theta would be F cosine theta times the perpendicular distance. Now, in this case, finding the perpendicular distance is really very easy because I know this length is L, right? So the moment of F double prime, which is what we're calling F cosine theta, is F cosine theta times L, right? Okay, so that's the moment of this component of the force. What about the moment of this force? Okay, so this one is pointing that way, and that's F prime, F sine theta, and what is the perpendicular distance between this force, line of action, and the center point of nut? Zero. Why? Because this line of action is actually going through this point, right? So there is no distance between the two, which means that the moment of this force is actually equal to zero. And that kind of, you know, matches with your day-to-day -day experience, right? If you were trying to open this nut and you had this wrench in your hand, if you pulled on the nut, there's no way you'll be able to rotate it. And this one is a pulling force. Right? So there's no moment due to that force. So if you add the moment of these two, basically there is no contribution from this, but there is contribution from this one, and that's, that is nothing but F cosine theta times L. And now you see, this one is same as this. So it doesn't matter which method you use, you will always get the same answer. So you can use either the perpendicular distance method, or you can use the component method. Okay? But you can't do both of them, right? Because then you'll be double counting for the same force. Right? So once you resolve a force along component direction, you can compute the moment of both of them. Right? So in this case, we really didn't have to worry about how to add the two moments because one of them was zero. Right? So let's talk about direction. So if you could, in general, have you know, some moment that will be positive, some moment that will be negative. So the question is, how do we find out which moments are positive, which moments are negative? Right? Okay, that's very, very simple, actually. So what we do is, this is a very simple graphical construction, right? This is something that you, in the beginning, maybe you'll draw on a piece of paper just to figure out the directions, but pretty soon you will see that you won't have to do it. You'll draw these circles in your head, and you'll be able to see it. Okay, so coming back to the same uh, wrench and nut problem. So let's say we have this force uh, F1 acting this way, okay? And this is not necessarily you know, perpendicular to this line, right? We have this force F1, and we are trying to compute the moment of this force. 
right? Moment is a vector quantity. It has direction, it has magnitude. Magnitude part we just saw. So we know the magnitude of the force. We multiply that with the perpendicular distance from the point of action. So we are not talking about that over here. This would be the perpendicular distance and the moment would be F1 times that distance, whatever that may be. So the question is, what is the sign? What is the uh, direction of this moment? So what you do is, choosing the point of pivot or the point of interest as the center point, draw a circle of the radius equal to the perpendicular distance. So when you do that, essentially you will have a circle that will be tangent to this line of action. Right? Or what you can do is, you can say, hey, I believe uh, in geometric construction, I will choose this as my center point and I will draw a circle that will be tangent to the line of action. So if you do that, the radius of that circle would be nothing but the perpendicular distance. Right? Now imagine that radius is actually a wheel. Okay? And if that's a wheel which is constrained to rotate about the point of interest or the pivot point, and if you push this wheel in this direction, which way would the wheel rotate? Clockwise, right? It's going to rotate clockwise. Now, clockwise direction for the moment is considered to be a negative direction. So that quantity is going to be negative. So we may write that this is a clockwise, uh, moment is a clockwise, but to do the algebra, you will put a minus sign in front of the magnitude cone. Okay? So clockwise is negative. Now, of course, the moment is really not in this plane. Remember that. The moment is not in the plane. Moment is actually in direction perpendicular to the plane of the line of action and these distances. Okay? Remember, all the distances, all the forces are in one plane. The moments always act perpendicular to them because of the cross product rule. Okay? So, because of the cross product rule, the moments are always perpendicular to that plane. Either they are above the plane or they are below the plane. If they are above the plane, they are considered to be positive. So, above the plane is counterclockwise direction. Right? Because if you try to rotate something in the counterclockwise direction with your right hand, your thumb points up. Right? Or you can think of it another way. With your right hand, if you take a screw driver and you try to rotate in the, clock, in the counterclockwise direction, the nut comes up, right? Or the screw comes up. That's the positive direction. Counterclockwise, positive direction. Clockwise, you tighten, things go inward, that's a negative direction. It's really that simple. So the moment of F1 is pointing in a clockwise direction, so that's a negative quantity. What about moment of this force F2? So if you look at F2, F2 is going this way. This is the point of interest. Draw a circle, right? Draw a circle. Imagine this is a wheel. If you apply this force F2 on this wheel, the wheel is going to rotate in the counterclockwise direction. So the moment of F2 is actually positive. So if somebody said, give me the net moment of both of these forces about this point, you will compute the moment of each of those forces individually. You look at their signs and you add them up. That's it. So your final answer may be positive, your final answer may be negative. And in some cases, the final answer may be zero, in which case we will see it, it will be called equilibrium condition. All right? Okay, so that's it. This is how you determine the duration of the moment. Any questions about this, right? Because if you learn this now well, you'll have a much easier time when you take 260. Right? You'll have zero problem in 260 then. For three-dimensional problem, you'll just do the cross products, okay? So this is, this is what it's showing you. Uh, this is for those guys who actually believe in, in doing this using cross product rule, and that's fine too. The counterclockwise direction is positive. So I'm assuming that I hat and J hat, which is your XY plane, in that plane you have the forces and all the distances, and then cross product gives you distances which are perpendicular to that plane, okay? Any questions about how to compute the magnitude of the moment or the addition of the moment? The, the perpendicular distance is used to compute the distance between the line of action and the point of pivot or the interest. So like in the previous slide, this is the force F. Perpendicular distance from this point to this line of action is you draw a line that is perpendicular to this. That is the perpendicular distance. Right? Any other questions about magnitude computation or direction? L is given to you. So it tells you what is the distance. Oh, when you do by component, then the component is f cosine theta. And this is already perpendicular to, to this, right? So that's same as L. So L is given to you. So it's, of course, some geometric information has to be given to you. You can have negative moment, right? That's what we have here. For, for F1, the moment is negative because it is causing the nut to rotate in a clockwise direction. And that is a negative moment. 
Clockwise is negative, counterclockwise is positive. That's it, that's all you need to remember. Okay, any other questions about these two slides? This is important, right? If you get this right, you'll have zero trouble in this chapter. Okay, all right, so moving on. So let's look at a few more uh, examples. So this is the bracket, right? Now this bracket is actually in the ground and somebody said, hey, go take it out. So in what direction should you really apply the force so that you can take it out easily, right? If you knew nothing about the moment, you might say, hey, I'm just going to pull it out, right? Mm. You might want to do that, you know, just want to pull it out, up, straight up, right? So if, you're doing, if you do that, then you're not really taking advantage of moments to make your work easy, right? So what should you do? Well, you could apply the force in this direction, you could apply the force in the vertical direction, or lower, you know, in a vertically downward direction, or towards the left, towards the right. So which way should you really be applying this force, right? So sure enough, let's say the force that you're applying is, is, is important, but it's moment that is more important to you, right? So how do you maximize the moment of this force? So let's say you're limited by how much force you can apply, right? Because you have limited strength. So it's not like that you can apply, you know, maybe, you know, two uh, metric ton of load on this bracket. So you can apply a fixed amount of force to take this bracket out. Now the only, now the only question is, which direction should you apply this force F in, right? So we already know the definition of the moment. The definition of the moment is force times perpendicular distance. So if force is a limiting factor, it's not changing, it's constant, then the only thing you can change is perpendicular distance, right? That's the only thing you can change. So perpendicular distance should be maximum or should be minimum? Should be maximum, right? For larger moment to happen about this point O, from where this bracket is going to come out, the perpendicular distance should be maximum, right? So what are the possible distances that you have? Well, if your force F is pointing horizontally, so if F is pointing this way, then what is the perpendicular distance? That's the line of action, and the perpendicular distance would be this, right? And how much is that? If this is L, and this is theta, so then this is L cosine theta, right? So in this case, let's say this is F1, and I will call M1 as the moment of F1, would be F times, F1 times uh, L cosine theta. And remember, F1 is same as force F, right? Because force F is not changing. I'm just writing F1 over here to distinguish between other directions. Okay, I could also apply force in this direction, let's say F2, right? In that case, the moment would be F2 times perpendicular distance to the line of action, which is this, and that is how much? L sine theta, so that's L sine theta, right? So we have F1, F1 times L cosine theta, F2 times L sine theta, and remember, here F1 is same as F2. I could also apply force in this direction, let's call it F3, which is along this. What is the perpendicular distance in that case? Zero, because that line of action is passing through the pivot point. So in this case, M3 is actually zero, right? So if you look at any of these quantities, all of these quantities are actually less than or equal to F times L, right? They're all less than or equal to F times L. Why? Because you have sine theta and cosine theta. We know sine theta and cosine theta have values between minus one to plus one, which means both of those quantities are always going to be less than F times L. And what is the maximum possible value? When theta is, in case of sine theta, when theta is pi by two, right? In case of cosine theta, when theta is zero. So the maximum possible value is nothing but F times L which means that you want your perpendicular distance to be L. And when would your perpendicular distance be L? If you apply a load in a direction perpendicular to L, right? That's the only situation when you can have the largest possible moment, right? So now with a little bit of knowledge of uh, moment, you know how to take the brackets out in an efficient way, right? Okay, so that's not difficult. This is another example. Uh, this is from your textbook, right? So you have a spanner and you have a nut and you want to compute the moment applied by these two forces, right? So you have 35 pounds over here, right? And you want to compute the moment about point O. What is the moment about point O of 35 pound load? So moment about point O is equal to, well, you draw the line of action, just extend it, and you draw the perpendicular, right? You draw the perpendicular. This is perpendicular from the point of action, which is O. And what is the distance given to you? Six inches. So the answer is 35 times six pound inches. And is that positive or negative? 
So when, when the question says find the moment, remember the moment is a vector quantity, so you have to give both direction as well as magnitude, not, not just give the magnitude part, right? So is it positive or negative? It's negative. How do we find it? Really simple. Point O is the point of rotation, so that becomes the center of your circle. You draw a circle that is tangent to the line of action, right? So that's the circle. And you're applying the force in the downward direction, which means that the circuit or the wheel is going to read in the clockwise direction, and that means the answer is negative. Yes? Yes. Clock, counterclockwise is, is positive and clockwise is negative. When did I say that? It's negative. This is clockwise, it's negative, right? Yes? Sure. Well, you want to maximize this quantity, right? F times L cosine theta. What is the maximum value of F times L cosine theta? F times L, because cosine theta has a maximum value of plus one, right? Which means theta should be zero in that quantity. So if F times L is the largest possible moment you can have, you already know the f, then perpendicular distance should be l, right? That should be this distance. And that's why the force should be pointing that way. In any other direction, it will be less than f times l. No, force is fixed. Force is not changing. The only thing you're trying to maximize is the perpendicular distance. And, the, and you can change the direction the force is applied. So the magnitude part of the force is fixed. What was that about? This has happened before too, right? Yeah, I think it'll come back. Yeah, L is the D. That's a perpendicular distance, right? Yes. Oh, a good question. So why is counterclockwise possible? It's a convention, right? So what we do is we use the right-handed quadrant system. In the right-handed quadrant system, when you do I cross J, you get K hat, and K hat points upward direction. If you use the left-handed quadrant system, counterclockwise actually becomes a negative quantity, and clockwise becomes positive. So it's just a convention. We stick with the right-handed quadrant system, and we do that consistently across all classes. But you know, you may find some, some books that may talk about left-handed quadrant system where both of these would be flipped, essentially. Sorry? Oh, that went too? <laughs> Has anyone hacked into these projectors? Uh, I mean, the cars are getting hacked these days. Maybe these are getting hacked too. Okay, all right, so what do we do? Uh, okay, well, it's all right. So we can talk about this stuff that we just discussed. Hopefully things will be back. Maybe, maybe I should call. All right, let me see. Hey, uh, we don't have projection anymore in 104. Yeah, they turned off, turned off both of them on their own. Sure. Okay. So, any any other questions from the moment? Yeah. Well, that's because it'll be easier to take it out that way. You, you will still apply a force, right? But, you know, it, it's sometimes easier to uh, apply a rotational force, which is the moment, to take it out. Because if you are, let's say, applying, um, let me put it this way. If you have something that is inside, and that was a bracket, right, we had, so something that is inside like this, this is called a cantilever. We'll talk about this, right? And cantilevers, they basically can exert a torque in the opposite direction. So you want to counter that torque. This is a cantilever action. If it was like a hinge, you won't need to apply a moment because you could just push it and it'll rotate freely. But this is cantilever. So cantilevers, basically, they apply a torque in the opposite direction. So to really take it out, you have to apply a moment. 
You see what I'm saying? I guess I'm confused of how it's fixed for the top point. That, yeah, that's the confusing part. Is like, where is it coming yeah, out how is it from? Fixed? Is, am I looking to, at something that needs a linear moment and then dealt out of a ground type thing? Like, oh, no. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So it's it, okay. So let me. You are actually chasing the wrong question. Let's not worry about how it is fixed, right? The question is, if I'm applying a force, how can I maximize the moment about that point? That, that, that part you understand. So, okay, so we, when we talk about the support reaction, so there are two kinds, all right, thank you. Yeah. So, do you know what the problem was? Okay. <laughs> all right, so there are different ways you can attach something, right? This is one way you can attach. So if you attach it this way, this is basically a hinge joint. In that case, you don't need, don't need any moment. But if you fix it inside, it's a cantilever. And that cantilever can resist the rotational motion, right? So that means that if you want to really take it out, you will be better off applying a moment to oppose that torque. Well, I mean, if, if you say that it, it's, there is a, like a gap over here around this thing, then you can just push it out, right? That, that would be fine. Then you don't need it a moment. Yeah. But anyway, it's not important how it is attached to the ground, right? That's not important. Okay, other questions? The moment captures basically the force that you're applying and the distance from the pivot point to the line of action. So it captures both of them, right? As we said, if you just apply the force at the pivot point, there is no way you can rotate that object, right? So you need to be farther away from the point of rotation so that you have a moment. So the moment is that physical quantity that tries to capture the notion of a force applied as well as the perpendicular distance. So the longer the perpendicular distance is, longer the lever arm is. <laughs> so so you, guys, you, you guys were probably on seesaw when you were a kid, right? So when you're on a seesaw, you, if, even if you didn't weigh as much, but if you were farther away from the point of uh, pivot, you could come down, right? And that's the same thing. So when you apply them, when you go farther away from the point of pivot, you're applying more moment. And that means you'll be rotating more. Right. Right. So force does cause the rotation, right? So if this is, let's say, your seesaw, and you are hinged over here, right? This is the point, And you are sitting over here. And you have a friend sitting over here. You know, your friend could weigh much more than you, but because you're farther away from the point of rotation, you can still bring the seesaw down, right? Because if we compute the moment due to your weight about the pivot point, it is going to be your weight times that distance L2, right? On the other hand, the moment of your friend would be his or her weight. Let's say this is M1 times G. Uh, this is M2 times G, we'll do this stuff pretty soon, then the moment due to your weight is M2G times L2, and the moment due to your force is M1G, the weight times L1. So even though M2 is less than M1, because L2 is much more than L1, you can still bring the, bring your side down. Right? Because the net moment is going to be in the clockwise direction. If you add the two moments, the net moment will be in the clockwise direction. And if the two moments are perfectly balanced, then you guys will be absolutely horizontal. Right? Now, you'll have the bracket dreams tonight. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, again, you know, we'll, we'll do a few more examples where you'll see how uh, we can use all these moment calculations, the lights. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Good. Okay, so now the next couple of things that, that we want to talk about is 
Uh, one is the concept of the free body diagram, very, very important. And then the concept of the static equilibrium. Okay? So, but before we talk about the free body diagram or equilibrium, I want to mention the three laws, which I'm pretty sure most of you have seen in some form uh, before. Okay? But, you know, it's best looking at these three again. The first one is in the absence of a net external force, if something is at rest, it will continue to remain at rest. If something is moving at constant velocity, it will continue to move at constant velocity. Right? Now, of course, in real life, if you have something moving at constant velocity, let's say you set it in motion and it's moving at some velocity, eventually it will come to rest due to friction and other things. Right? Which means that to keep, make it, keep, to keep it going at constant velocity, you'll have to apply a net external force. That's the only way it will remain at constant velocity. Right? That's what happens in real life. But if you have no net external force applied on an object, you know, like something like this, it will be at rest. Right? All the forces are balanced. If something is moving at constant velocity, it will continue to move at constant velocity unless there is an external push or pull applied on it. Right? That's the Newton's first law. Second law says that if we know all the forces applied on a particle or an object, we can relate it with the acceleration experienced by the object. Okay? And what is that relationship? It's sigma f equal to m times a. So for the same amount of force, if there is larger mass, larger inertia, acceleration would be less, right? Now, Newton's first law at this point can be seen as a special case of second law, actually. Why? Because if, let's say, there is no net external force, then sigma f would be equal to zero. So the left-hand side of that equation would be zero, and that means m times a would be zero, and that means since m is not zero in general, acceleration would be zero. What does that mean? Acceleration is nothing but rate of change of velocity, right? So if initial velocity was zero, your later velocities would be zero too. So if something is at rest, it remains at rest. Again, acceleration is zero, which means velocity is constant. So if something is moving at one velocity, it will continue to move at the same velocity. Right? So first law is really nothing but a special case of second law when sigma f is equal to zero. Right? The third law says that for every action, which is same as force, there is a reaction, which is a force in the opposite direction equal in magnitude and collinear, right? So if I push on something, that thing is going to push back on me with the same magnitude and in the same direction, in the opposite direction, but in the same line, right? So it's not going to be in two different lines. So those are the three laws for the Newtons and we will need them uh, in this class. Okay, so let's talk about free body diagram. A free body diagram is an incredibly useful and important tool for doing the force and moment analysis. You will need this in time and again in different classes, not just 101. Right? So if you learn this well now, you'll see that you will have a much easier time in statics and dynamics as well as kinematics class. Right? So what is a free body diagram? Free body diagram is nothing but a visual illustration or a pictorial tool for showing all the forces and all the moments that act on an object. Now, that object could be just one particle, one thing, or it could be a system of particles, multiple things together. Now, it is not just a picture. Let me remind you, free body diagram is not just a picture that you draw. Free body diagram is something that you will use to do all the analysis after that. So if your free body diagram is wrong, your all the analysis is going to be wrong. And if your free body diagram is correct, it's just a mechanical process to get to the final answer. So this is the key step to doing the force and moment analysis being able to draw a free body diagram correctly. And the good news is that it's not difficult to learn that. Right? As long as you pay attention to the details, you will see that you'll be able to get it. Right? So let's start with an example. Right? This is, this is the, the picture I showed you guys in the last class as well. Right? A girl is pushing on a car. What are the forces acting on the girl and on the car? Gravity. So gravity is pulling both of them down. Right? Gravity is pulling the, the girl down. Gravity is trying to pull the car down. Any other forces? Friction forces between? Between the car and the ground. Friction forces between the car and the ground. Normal forces. So the forces that the ground is applying on the car and on the girl, right? Because if somebody is standing on something and if it's being supported, that means there has to be a supporting force. That's the normal reaction he's talking about on the car, right? That's true. So you also have the force that the girl is applying on the car. So there's a force of push on the car by the girl. Friction force on the ground between the girl 
and the ground, right? So that's, there is a friction force between those two as well. Car is pushing back on her, right? So that's the Newton's third law. If, for, if there's a five Newton force being applied by the girl on the car, the car is applying the same force on the girl in the opposite direction. Air resistance, of course, you have air resistance as well, right? You have air resistance as well. Anything else? Friction between the girl and the car, right? So if, if let's say the, the hands have to stay on the surface of the car, then there should be friction. Otherwise, it's going to probably slide, right? So there's friction between the girl and the car as well. Any other forces? You guys have pretty much accounted for all the forces, right? But here's the thing. When you solve problems, you don't necessarily show all the forces. There, are, there is something called reasonable assumptions that you make. Most of the time, we neglect the air resistance. Okay, unless, it's, unless the problem is talking about, you know, an object moving, moving through a fluid, you know, so maybe a, an object dropping through the air or moving through uh, water, we don't talk about the drag forces from the fluid medium. At least we won't be concerned with those forces in this class. So air resistance is not something that we'll have to worry about. In, okay, not in this class, right? If you take a fluid mechanics class, you will definitely be worried about, worried about the drag forces from the fluid medium. We will also uh, sometimes neglect the friction forces. So for example, we might say that, hey, if the car is rolling smoothly on this incline, there is no friction force between the ground and the wheels, right? In some cases, it will be very, very clear when you would should take into account the friction forces. For example, if you have, let's say, a two-wheel drive car, right? And it's a front-wheel drive car. Then the torque from the engine is being applied on the front wheels only which means that there will be friction forces on the wheel from the ground on the front two wheels. But your rear wheels are not driven by the engine, so you neglect the friction forces from the ground on them because there's no traction available to the rear wheels, right? And that's why, you know, when you drive your car in snow or in, in conditions when things are kind of slick on the, on the road, then you prefer to have an all-wheel drive. Why? Because all the four wheels can have traction or the friction from the ground. Right? So in that case, if somebody tells you we have an all-wheel drive, by all means show the friction forces on all the wheels. But if, let's say, none of them are being driven, like in this case, if nothing is being driven, you can say, hey, I'm going to neglect the friction force on the wheels from the ground. Now, what about the friction force between the ground and the girl's feet? Can you neglect that friction? You can, right? Because if she's going to be pushing on this car in the forward direction, and the car is going to be pushing her in the backward direction, then she needs to have friction so that she can hold her place or move forward, right? Otherwise, she's going to skid down. So that friction cannot be neglected. So there are certain forces that we'll definitely show. There are certain forces that we will choose to neglect, and we have to state that in assumption. Another assumption that we make in, in engineering is the assumption of a physical object idealize that as a particle or as a rigid body. So what's the difference? A particle in engineering is not a mathematical particle. We deal with what are known as engineering particles. Engineering particles have mass, but they have no size or shape or volume. So we can idealize physical objects as point objects, as points, you'll just show them as a point, but they have mass. And it's an engineering particle. It's not a mathematical particle. Mathematical particles are just points. They don't, they don't have any mass. Most of the time, if you have no rotation involved, if you have just a translation, things moving, you know, where all the points are behaving in an identical fashion, you can regard physical objects as particles. And you will see, you know, that uh, in your engineering studies and dynamics class. But if things rotate, you can not generally regard them as particles. Right? And particle assumption has nothing to do with the size of an object. You can treat a, a spaceship, a satellite, and an aircraft as a particle. If you are only interested in its gross motion, you know, for example, if I said, hey, you know, find out the time it takes for an aircraft to travel from New York to, let's say, New Delhi. Okay? You don't worry about how much of the wings are fluttering while it is moving. Right? You just regard it as a particle, which has a certain mass. And you apply your kinematics equation to find out how much time it would take for it to get from New York to New Delhi. Right? On the other hand, if you are interested in finding out how much wings really flex while you know, it is going through the turbulent weather, because you want, you're trying to design the wing geometry, then you cannot regard it as a particle, because you have to take into account the rotation. Right? So depending on your application, depending on the sort of problem you're trying to solve, you can regard a physical object as a particle or as a rigid body. 
In this class, most of the time we will neglect the rotation. Okay, so most of the things can be regarded as particle, but there will be situations where we won't regard things as particles. So we will actually treat them as a rigid body object and we will have rotation as well. So coming back to this example, what we will do is we will regard both of these physical objects, the girl and the car, as particles. So even though I'm showing them completely, you could just choose to draw a dot and show all the forces going through that, right? So in this case, if you look at the free body diagram of the girl, you only show the forces acting on the girl, right? So the first step in drawing the free body diagram is that you isolate the object of interest, okay? You say, I'm going to draw the free body diagram of this particular object. In this case, that object happens to be the girl. So imagine drawing a boundary around the girl, okay? And whatever objects cut across the boundary, you need to replace the effect of presence of those objects by the forces they exert on, on, the, on the girl. So girl is interacting with how many things? Girl is interacting with car. Girl is interacting with ground. And girl is interacting with the earth, right? Those are the three things it's interacting with. So that's the first question you need to ask. Identify the object. What are the other things that it's surrounding that it is interacting with? And remember, what is the force? Force is nothing but characterization of an interaction. So now all you need to do is look at those interaction and replace those interactions with the forces that those other objects in the surrounding exert on this, right? Okay, so let's look at it. Girl is pushing on the car. Newton's third law says that car is going to push back on the girl. So you have this force of push pointing in the opposite direction, right? Then you have the reaction from the ground that is pushing the girl up. And remember, normal reactions are always perpendicular to the direction of the surface. So surface is inclined. So the normal direction is perpendicular to that incline, right? So that's the normal reaction on the girl. And notice how I didn't draw the ground. And that's a very commonly made mistake. Students, they also draw the ground and they also show the normal reaction. Well, the whole point of showing the normal reaction is that you're replacing the ground because the ground is exerting this reaction. So you do not draw the, the ground. Okay, so this is not, free body diagram is not just a pretty picture that you're drawing. It is really something that you will use to do the analysis in the next step, okay? So normal reaction from the girl and ground is gone, right? Friction force, which way the friction force should point? Well, girl has a tendency to slide down, friction force has to push it up, right? So you have the friction force along the incline, which, which you are calling F is friction. You have the weight of the girl, mass times gravity, right? Any other forces on the girl? Normal force from? We have that, right? This is the N girl, right? Right here, the normal force, N. That's it, right? These are all the forces. Now, of course, one of the students over there said that, hey, we have friction also between the, the girl's hands and the car. And that's true, because you don't want the, girl, the hands to slide. If you wanted to account for that friction, that friction force would be pointing either in the upward direction or in the downward direction, but it'll be tangent to the back of this car, right? That's how it will be shown. But we are choosing to uh, neglect that. All right, now let's look at the free body of the car. What forces act on the, free, on the car? Well, we of course have the push from the girl in that direction. We have the weight of the car. We are neglecting the friction because the car is not being driven. The engine is not applying any torque. So these wheels are essentially free rolling wheels. And that's why we are choosing to not show the friction on the wheels. We have the weight of the car and we have the two normal reactions, right? So since I'm, this is a three-dimensional car, of course, so you could say that, hey, I'm going, if N2 is the reaction force on the two rear wheels, then this will be 2N2, and if N1 is the reaction on one wheel in the front, then this will be 2N1. But in this case, if I show N1 and N2 like this, then I'm essentially saying that, hey, we have half of that on each of the front wheels. Uh, question. How does the force of friction on the girl going up the incline? Okay, so why is the force of friction on the girl going uh, up the incline? So the rule is that the job of the friction force is to prevent the sliding, right? So if the girl were to slide, which way would she slide? Is she going to slide up? No, she's going to slide down, right? So the friction force job is to oppose that sliding, and that's why friction force has to point up, right? So you just look at the sliding, and that tells you which way the friction force should point, right? Another important piece of information in this slide is that you always have to show the coordinate system. Okay, and you know, these are a matters of habit. This will be needed 
if you don't draw the coordinate system, we will not know how you are going to show these forces or how you're going to write these forces when you finally write some of the forces equation or some of the moment equation. So you always have to show the coordinate system. And notice how I've chosen my x direction to be direction along the incline. It is not pointing in the horizontal direction. Why? Because both the girl and the car are, are going to be traveling along the incline. So I'm just going to make my x-axis to be along the incline because then I don't have to worry about any movement in the y direction. On the other hand, if I showed my x direction to be this way and y direction to be that way, then I have to resolve all the forces along x and y direction. And why do I want to make my life difficult when I can make it easier? Right? Okay, so that's good. Now, what about the free body diagram of the whole thing? We can always draw a free body diagram of more than one object, the car and the girl together. What about the free body diagram of the girl and the car together? What forces would be acting on both of them together? If I identified my interest, uh, object of interest as both of them together, what are the forces acting on the system? Mg, we still have the gravitational pull, right? So we'll have the weight of the girl, weight of the car. Friction force between the girl and the, f and the ground, right? Normal force, both N girl and two would be pointing. What about F push? What about this push, this force? That will not be shown for the system, right? Because that's an internal force now. There is a force of friction on the girl, right? Is that what you were asking? Absolutely. So the car is exerting the same force at push in the backward direction, okay. right? I, I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. That's a free body diagram. Yeah. And you're accounting for the car at this point. Why do you have two normal forces? On these two? Yeah. Oh, good question. That's an excellent question. So why do we have two different normal reactions? If I'm going to regard it as a particle, do I need to have two normal reactions? No. If I'm going to regard it as a particle, then I'm not going to need it, right? There will be just one normal reaction. But if I treat it as a rigid body object, then I could potentially have two separate normal reactions, right? In what situation those two normal reactions be same? When it's symmetric, right? So if the center of mass of this car is right over here, and both N1 and N2 are equidistant from that center of mass, then there will be no reason to assume that N1 and N2 are actually different from each other. In fact, you could start by assuming that they were different from each other, but you will finally get that they're the same. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, just because I want to make sure I heard you right. You're saying in that picture, like N1 is the force on like, the two front wheels? On the two front wheels, right. Yeah. 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 And in general, they may not be the same. If you regard them as particles, then these, there would be no two reactions. It would be just one reaction, right? But if you regard it as a physical object, uh, which is a rigid body, then, of course, you can have two different reactions, right? So you can see, right, in this example, we have, uh, we have a situation where we regarded the girl as a particle, but the car as a rigid body. If I wanted to regard the girl also as a rigid body, then I could probably show the normal reaction on both the feet separately, right? Right now, I have just one, because I'm regarding it as a, as a particle. But if you have two feet away from each other, then you could draw the normal reaction on both of them, and they both could be different from, from each other, right? Yes? Uh, when you put the car at the wheel, you rotate, so why are we ignoring the moment of inertia on the wheels? We're not neglecting the moment of inertia of the wheel. It's just that there is no friction force on the wheel, because there is no... I understand there is no friction, but right. there is a moment of inertia on the wheels, right? Right. But the moment of inertia, okay, so we're sort of ahead of us right now. Moment of inertia is like a moment, is like the mass quantity, right? So moment of inertia, if you want to relate with the torque, it's torque equal to moment of inertia times alpha. If there's no torque, it doesn't matter whether you have moment of inertia or not. Your angle acceleration would be zero. We can talk about this. Is, this is not relevant to discussion right now. We can talk about that after the class. Okay? All right. So this is good. So we, we understand how to draw free body diagram, right? There could be a different normal force, yes, yeah. So for example, I'm standing over here, right? Let's say I'm standing over here. I have, I have two legs, right? I'm standing like this. I could stand like this. Is my normal reaction different on both the feet? Of course it is. 
right? If I treat myself as a particle, a single point with the mass of whatever mass my, I have, then I will just show one normal reaction. But depending on how I, I stand, I could have a normal reaction, right? Okay, so let's look at another example. This one is probably a little bit simpler. So we have three books, right? I'm label, I've labeled them as A, B, C, right? On top of each other, stacked on top of each other. We want to draw a free body diagram of each of those books. So let's start with the top one, A, okay? So A is interacting with the book B, right? And it's interacting with the gravitational pull. So you have the normal reaction from the B applied on A in the upper direction, that's Na dash B, and the weight is Mag, right? Simple. Let's look at the book B. Book B is interacting with book A and book C. What is the job of book A? Book A is pushing down on B, and what is that normal reaction? It's this Na dash B pointing downward, right? Okay, oops. And then we have the weight of the book, and then we have the normal reaction from the C on the B on the bottom surface of the B, because C is going to be pushing B up, because C is supporting B, so we have NB dash C, right? Okay. What about C? C is on the floor, and I didn't draw the floor, I should have actually drawn the floor. C is supported by the floor, and, uh, or the table maybe. So you have the NC dash ground push, pushing it up, you have the gravity, and you have the normal reaction from the B on the C, that's NB dash C. Right? So essentially we have how many unknowns here? We have NA dash B, NB dash C, and NC ground. Right? That's a free body diagram. Any questions about this? Why am I using the normal reaction? Yeah, instead of the weight of what? The book okay, I was hoping somebody would ask that question. So thanks for asking that. So I'm pretty sure some of you have this question, but you know are afraid to ask it or shy enough to ask this question. So what he's asking is that you have B over here and A is on top of B, right? So B will experience some weight of A. Right? Similarly, C will experience the weight of both A and B on top of it. So how are we accounting for those? How are we accounting for those? Well, we are accounting for those, but here's the thing. Gravitational pull is an interaction between an object and the gravitational attraction of the Earth. Right? The way you are accounting for the weight of A and B is indirectly through these normal reactions. So if there was no weight of this, there would be no normal reaction, right? So if you look at A and assume that A is not going anywhere, which means it has no acceleration, so from Newton's second law, some of the forces on A should be equal to zero, then Na dash B would be equal to the weight of A, right? And if you look at B, and if B is not going anywhere, then all the forces would be balanced on B as well. In that case, the Nb dash C would be equal to the weight of B plus Na dash B, which is nothing but the weight of A. So you do get that, right? It's just that you are accounting for the weight of the things above an object of interest indirectly through the normal reaction. What if it's an incline? Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter whether it's an incline or not. You only have to worry about the interaction. So if you're drawing free body diagram, you need to ask this question from yourself. What are the other objects in a surrounding that this is interacting with? And that's it. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. The normal force on the top and the bottom? Well, they may or may not be the same. We, you can compute what they would be, right? I, you know, this is not an exercise I want to do right now because I want to get to the equilibrium analysis first, but we could do it now that you guys are asking. So Na dash B would be equal to MAG. And this is for book A, right? The normal reaction on the book A is same as this weight. If you look here, both of these forces are pointing, pointing downward. This one is pointing upward. If this is an equilibrium, if it is not going anywhere, then all the forces should balance, which means that this should be equal to Na dash B plus MBG. And we just saw that this is equal to MAG, so this is nothing but MA plus MB times G, right? Let's come to this one. NC ground would be equal to NB dash C plus MBG, right? And we just saw NB dash C is equal to this quantity. So this would be MA plus MB plus, well, sorry, this is MC, MC times G. 
So which means that the normal reaction from the ground on C would have to be equal to the weight of all the three books. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you were to draw a free body diagram of A, B, and C together as a system, what forces would you show? You would only show the normal reaction from the ground and you'll show all the gravitational pull and they'll balance out. So you'll get the same answer. Yes? Does that answer your question? Right? Okay, so this is a, a, a practice, right? So we want to create a free body diagram for the sled and for the sled with the children picture below, right? So first is, how do we draw free body diagram for the sled alone minus the kids, right? That's what we want to do. So we have the sled over here. Let me first write free body diagram of the sled. And this is the rope. So somebody's pulling on the rope, assuming, right? So what are the forces acting on the sled? We have the tension, somebody's pulling on the rope. We have the weight of the sled, let's call it W, right? We have the normal reaction from the kids, let's assume they're a particle. So we have the normal reaction from the kids. We have the normal reaction from the ground, let's call it N ground. And we will call this N sub kids. Okay, any other forces on the sled? Friction force, so if the sled is sliding, then you also have the force of friction from the ground. Anything else? So if the kids sitting in the sled are not sliding with respect to the sled, then there has to be a friction force exerted by the kids on the sled as well, right? If there is a relative motion, if there's no friction between the them, then it's not a problem. But assuming, and that's, that's what happened in most of the cases, if the kids are not sliding inside the sled, right, they stay where they are, then there will also be a force of friction, let's call it F sub F1, between the kids and the sled, right? If you wanted to draw the free body diagram for the sled with the children, that'll be an e even easier one, because both of these forces would be internal forces, so the only force would be all of these that you're showing, plus the weight of the kids, right? Okay. <coughs> Now, in engineering, you'll find that there are a lot of structures that come with various kinds of supports. Okay? And we need to understand what kind of reactions those supports actually exert. Okay? So these are some of the different kinds of supports you'll see. Cable, rope, chain, pin, roller, built-in, cantilever. Right? So the question is, what kind, of, what kind of reactions we get from them? So let's look at cable. Cables can only be in tension. Right? You cannot really compress them. If you try to compress them, they'll just deform. So they can only be in tension. So if you have a situation like this, where you're trying to pull on something, and you draw a free body diagram of this paint bucket, you will have the weight of the paint bucket, and you'll have the tension pointing upward, right? Really very simple. So the tension part is easy to understand. Cable, rope, chain, they can only support tensile forces. An example, if you have a sign, right, connected by two cables, we know cables can only apply the tension. So what you have to do is you just have to draw the tension, and in this case, they're drawn in the tangent direction, and you have the weight. That's it, right? And notice how I also draw the quartz system. It's very important. Then we have commonly supported reactions. Now, when you get to 260 and 363, you will deal with these kinds of things pretty much every day, right? So it's important to understand this now. So a lot of trusses and the bridges, they actually have this kind of basic support structure, and it's called a simply supported structure, right? What do you have in the simply supported structure? You have a beam, right? And you know, th there would be typically repetition of this on, on a truss or a bridge. You have a beam. On one end, you have what is known as a pin joint. A pin joint is basically no different from a pivot or a hinge, like what you have in your doors over here, okay? The technical term we use is pin joint, but it's nothing but a hinge, right? What is a pin joint? Pin joint basically allows rotation, right? So if I hold it over here, and this thing is freely allowed to rotate about this, that's a pin joint. Okay, there is nothing that will prevent it from rotating apart from maybe the friction that you may have at the hinge, right? Otherwise, it's freely rotating. Okay, no friction, no torque, no moment that will oppose this motion. But if you try to pull it from here, it's going to keep it here, right? Which means that if you take the pin support away and you draw the free body diagram of this object, there will be forces that will keep it in this direction, right? And that force could be in this plane, either in x direction or y direction, or in both of them. So in general, we say that 
pin joints can apply two reaction forces, one along x direction, another along y direction. Why both of them? Because we don't know which way the real force is going to be pointing. So we just say we have two components, right? Because if you take this, it can freely rotate about this point, but it cannot get away from that point. Because if you try to pull it, this is going to keep it in this place, right? Then on the other end, you have a roller. So now see what can happen. As this thing extends, because of maybe you know thermal expansion or anything like that, this end is free. It is not constrained at one point, right? it's free, which means that as it moves, the roller can allow it to nicely roll, right? It can allow it to nicely roll, which means that at this point, the only force you can have is the one that will be in the direction perpendicular to the tangent. The tangent line is this, so the direction is just a normal reaction. Because in x direction, there is no constraint. It can freely move in the x direction, and there is no constraint for rotation as well. So there's no moment, there's no extension force, the only force you have is in the y direction. So if I give you something like this and say, hey, draw a free body diagram of this beam, you will draw these two reaction forces, you'll draw this, sub, this normal reaction, and it'll show the weight. That's it. That's a simply supported object. If I put two pin joints, you'll have two reactions here, you'll have two reactions over here. If I put two rollers, I'll have one reaction over here, I'll have one reaction over here. So depending on what sort of connection you have, you could have different number of unknowns. Right? You'll have different number of unknowns. In this case, you have three unknowns. If you have two pin joints, you'll have four unknowns. You have two rollers, you'll have two unknowns. Right? This is another example uh, called cantilever. So this is the sort of uh, attachment that you can create if you push something in inside, let's say, a, a plank or, or you create a rivet joint, that will be also a cantilever action. And essentially what a cantilever action does is it not only gives you a reaction force in XY direction, but it also prevents rotation. Right? So if I take this thing and you really push it through the wall or attach it with a plate which is riveted or screwed or bolted, then it will, allow, it will not allow this rotation to happen, which means if you try to push in this direction, there will be a counterclockwise rotation. There will be a moment in the opposite direction. Right? So we say that a cantilever support can provide not only X and Y direction forces, but also a counteracting moment. So you have three unknowns with the cantilever support. Right? So pin join, two reaction forces. A roller, one, and with a cantilever, now you have three unknowns. So if you try to apply a force in this direction, there is a counteracting moment, right? Okay, so that's good. So let's say we have this kind of truss bridge, right? And those of you who are from the civil engineering probably will appreciate a lot. Uh, so we have a truss bridge like this. And we can see that on one end, we have a pin joint, we have a roller. So this is a whole thing is a simply supported structure. And there's some weight of this truss, right? So what's the free body diagram of this? How do you draw a free body diagram of the whole truss? It's really very simple. All you have to do is draw this bridge without any support shown, without any ground. We know that point A, you can have reaction forces along X and Y direction. And at point B, you can only have reaction in the vertical direction. That's the normal and the weight. And then you show your quartet system. That's it. That's your free body diagram, right, for the truss bridge. Okay, another example. So, in this case, we have an object that is supported on a platform, on a plank, right? And there's a cable, right? First question, what kind of support do you think you have between this wall and the platform at point A? Is it a cantilever? It's a pin joint, right? It cannot be a cantilever because you need to allow rotation about this point, right? So this is a pin joint. So if it is a pin joint, then if you want to draw the free body diagram of the platform, you only have the reaction forces, which, is, which are X and Y, AX and AY. You have this cable. Cables can only exert forces in the longitudinal direction, so that's a tension force, so we show that. We have the weight of the platform, and we have the normal reaction from the object on the platform. Right? We're calling it N sub C. And that's the free body diagram. Okay, so we are in chapter four from Jonathan Wickett's book, which is Forces and Moments in the Structures and Machines. And we have talked about the concept of forces. We talked about the concept of moments. And we have said that, hey, the concept of force alone is not sufficient to make something rotate, right? Because you need that force applied at a certain distance away from the hinges to make something rotate. And that brought in the notion of the moment, where we had the concept of force, we had the concept of perpendicular distance from the hinge. Then we talked about Newton's three laws. Now, the last topic in this chapter is the, is the topic of static equilibrium.
Okay, so when you take 260, which is engineering statics class, this is what you'll be doing day in, day out in that class, right? So next 10, 15 minutes are supposed to give you a flavor of what you would possibly learn in 260 class. And of course, you have a bunch of problems that you'll have to solve from your homework. And equilibrium analysis is something that you will also perform while doing some of your homework assignments on the homework bot that we'll be giving to you very soon, perhaps in the next seven to eight days' time, uh, and also for the project, okay? So what is equilibrium? Well, equilibrium is defined by a very simple condition. The condition says that if you have a structure, if you have a machine, if you have a bunch of forces applied on it, then it is in equilibrium if some of all the external forces acting on it is zero. Okay, so if somebody says that something is equilibrium, then you can simply apply this condition, sigma f equal to zero. All right? A second condition is that the next net external moment about any point is zero. Remember, when you take the moment, you take the moment about a particular point, right? You've done some homework problems in your current homework due on Thursday where you had to compute the moment about certain points, right? Those were moments of maybe some forces only, and those moments may not be zero. But if something is in equilibrium, and if you take moment of all the external forces acting on that part about any point, the sum of that would be zero. That's the basic idea. So sigma f equal to zero and sigma m equal to zero. That's it. Now you can use these two conditions to solve for some of the unknown quantities in the problem, right? So we'll look at an example pretty soon. So what are the what are the what is the process? What is the method for solving equilibrium problems? The, the method is very simple. First thing you will do is you'll draw the free body diagram of the isolated object. So you would look at your object of interest. Now that object of interest may be just one single item or could be a collection of items, right? And you will draw the free body diagram of that. Now your free body diagram will show all the forces and the moments acting on it, right? That's the number one thing you'll do. Then you will apply the equilibrium condition and the two equilibrium conditions are that you'll set net forces to zero. So you'll sum up all the forces acting on it and you equate it to zero. Now, if you sum all the forces to be zero, and if you're writing the vector sum in a plane, let's say xy plane, then that would reduce to two scalar equations because you have components along i hat direction, you have components along j hat direction, and what you would essentially get is two scalar equations, right? Then you can also set the net moment about any point to zero. Now, you can pick the point about which you want to compute the moment. There will be certain points that will be a better choice compared to others. Right? And you know, pretty soon you will see which points will be better in what situation. But you can pick any point, and about any point, if you compute the net moment of all the external forces acting on it, then that would be equal to zero as well. Now, the moment equation will give you only one scalar equation, right? Because the moment is either clockwise or counterclockwise. So either it is positive or negative. So there is no i hat or j hat. Essentially, that equation is along k hat direction, which is perpendicular to the xy plane. So if your forces and your position vectors are all in the xy plane, then the moments are always going to be in the z direction, right? So either it will be plus z or minus z, so you don't need to really say k hat. It's the sign that takes care of uh, the direction. So essentially, you'll have no more than three equations, three scalar equations for each part, which is in equilibrium, right? If you have three scalar equations, how many unknowns you can solve for at most? Three, that's it, right? So three equations, three unknowns. So that's what you would have to do. You have to count the unknowns and make sure that you have enough equations. If you find that your number of unknowns are four and you have only three equations, then chances are that maybe you have neglected something or you have accounted for something more than it needs to be. Or that maybe you need to actually do the analysis on two parts, not just one part, right? Because for each part, you can get three equations. For two parts, you can get up to six equations. And then finally, you have to solve for the unknown quantities, right? And I say over here that it is sometimes simpler, more judicious to choose the pivot point about which you compute the moment to be the one where the forces are acting in such a way that you have less, least information about them, okay? So for example, if let's say I draw a structure that looks like this, okay? You have this structure. And you have a point over here. Maybe there's a hinge joint over here. Let's call this point A. And I have a force along x direction, force along y direction. Let me draw the coordinate system. Okay, a pin joint can support reactions along both x and y direction. So I have forces over there. And then somebody is pulling here with the force of F. All right, and problem tells you that this structure is in equilibrium. 
Okay, equilibrium is same as a static equilibrium. The, the more precise thing to say is to say static equilibrium, but sometimes people just say equilibrium and is the same as a static equilibrium. So, if this structure is in equilibrium, then we know that some of the forces should be equal to zero and some of the moment should be equal to zero. But if the question says that, if this is an equilibrium, give me what this force F is, okay, give me what this force F is. Let's say, you know, just to make things a little bit more interesting, I have another force G over here. Okay, so two forces F on this direction, G in this direction, and I want to know what F is. All right, and I already know what G is. Let's say this is given as 10 Newton. All right, so I can solve this problem by writing sigma F equal to zero, and I can write sigma M equal to zero, right? And I know that this is going to give me two equations, and this is going to give me one equation. So I'll have total three equations. From three equations, I can solve for three unknowns. Let's look at the problem. Just from the free body diagram, I can count the unknowns, right? I have F as, as one unknown, AX as second unknown, and AY as third unknown, right? G is already given to you. So you have three unknowns. You can solve for the three unknowns from this. So you can sum all the forces to be zero and along X direction, sum all the forces along Y direction to be zero, and then you can take moment about some point. So now the question is, about which point should you compute the moment? I can take moment about, you know, point A, I can take moment about maybe let's say this point is C, and I can take moment about this point B, right? Or any other point, doesn't even have to be a point of application of these three forces. I could pick, you know, center of mass of this thing and say I will take moment about that point, right? But no matter which point I pick, some of the moment about that point should be equal to zero. So in this question, if only F is being asked for, I am better off actually choosing point A as the point about which I will compute the moment. Why? Because if I take moment about point A, then what will be the moment of AX and AY? Zero, because AX and AY are passing through point A, right? Pushing on the hinges. So there is no contribution in the moment quantity from AX and AY, because AX and AY are going through point A, right? Okay, what about moment due to force G? Well, for that, I can try to find what the perpendicular is. So it, I have the line of action of G, I extend it, and then I drop a perpendicular from point A onto this. So using trigonometry and geometry, I could find that. Or if let's say I know the angle of G from horizontal, let's say this is theta, then I can resolve G along X direction and Y direction and use the component method to solve for the moment of G. And I could do the same for the moment of F, right? I could either resolve it along component direction or I could try to find the perpendicular to the line of action and multiply F with that, figure out what the sign would be, whether it will be positive or negative. And now I have only one equation where the only unknown is F. So just one moment equation, just one moment equation. So sigma M about A equal to zero gives me the answer. Because the question is not asking for AX and AY. So if the question is not asking for AX and AY, then you can choose that point as the point about which you compute the moment so that you don't have to solve for AX and AY. And that's what I'm saying over here. It is simpler to choose the pivot point to be the one through which the forces are passing about which you have the least information. And AX and AY is something that the question is not asking for, so you can just choose that as the pivot point, right? Now, this is telling you that there is no one single way to solve the problem then, right? Because you could have just written sigma F equal to zero and that would involve AX, AY, and components of G and F along X direction, as well as components of those in Y direction equated them to zero. And essentially, you would end up solving three linear equations and three unknowns, which will be simultaneous. And you would essentially get all the unknowns. You will know not only F, but also AX and AY. But if the question is not asking for AX and AY, then why necessarily waste your time doing this, right? Okay, another example. So this is an example of a drawbridge. Right? So the question is, you have this drawbridge over here, right? and you can see this is the uh, platform that you are trying to actually lift. There is a, it's connected with a cable at one end, right? and it is hinged at point A, because this is allowed to rotate, so point A has to be a hinge. Okay. So given this drawbridge, the question is, what is the tension in the supporting cable of this 14 meter long and 11,000 kilogram drawbridge? So how do we solve this problem? Well, if the question is not saying anything about equilibrium, you can assume equilibrium, at least in MEC 101 class. All right? So you can assume that this is an equilibrium. So if this is an equilibrium, then we know we can apply two conditions. So how do we solve equilibrium problems? Well, first thing you have to do is identify the object. 
So the object is the platform, right? The bridge itself. So you draw an imaginary boundary around it, and you see where that boundary cuts across other elements that this bridge is interacting with. And this bridge is connected to the cable. This bridge is connected at point A to the ground, right? So we know at point A, we have a pivot point. We have a hinge joint. So point A can support reactions in both x and y direction. So the free body diagram, I show ax and ay, right? The moment I show ax and ay, it should come to my mind that I have to show my coordinate system. So I had is pointing this way, j had is pointing that way, right? Okay. Then we have the weight of the bridge. So we show that through the center of mass. And then I have the tension in the cable, which will be along the cable. So I show that as well. Now, what do I know about this tension? I don't know the magnitude, but I do know the angle at which it is acting, right? Because the angle is given to be 15 degree from horizontal. So I know the angle. So about this vector, this force, which is a vector, I know 50% of the information, which is the direction. I don't know the magnitude. So the question is asking for the magnitude. OK, so I got AX, AY, I got MG, and T. If this is an equilibrium, then I can write sigma F equal to 0, and I can write sigma M equal to 0, right? Now, the question is only asking for the tension. So it is judicious to choose your moment point to be point A, just like in the previous problem. So if you pick the moment about point A, then there will be no contribution to the moment term from AX and AY, right? Because AX and AY are passing through A. So that's what I'll do. I'll say sigma MA is equal to 0. In fact, not only sigma MA, if I take point B and I compute the moment about point B, that would be equal to 0 too. And I can also take the moment about point C, let's say the point C is the center of this platform, and that will be equal to 0 too, right? But we are interested in only in tension, so I can choose sigma MA equal to 0. Now all I have to do is write the moment of each of these forces, right? Okay, so let's look at MG. So MG is entirely along negative y direction, right? So if I drop the perpendicular from point A to MG, it will be what quantity? It will be L by 2, and this is 30, so this is L by 2 cosine 30. So MG by 2, L times cosine 30, uh, is the moment of mg. What is the sign? This force is going to rotate about point A in the clockwise direction. How do we know that? Remember, you can always draw the, the circle that's tangent to the line of action. So this is the line of action. This is the point A. So you'll make A as your center and draw a circle such that the circle is tangent to this line of action. The force is pushing it downward, which means circle is, or the gear, or the wheel, whatever you think of it as, is going to rotate clockwise, that means moment is negative, and that's why we have the minus sign here, right? Okay, so for mg, we use the perpendicular distance. Why? Because it's really known over here, right? Okay, so now let's look at t. So for t, we will resolve it along x and y direction. We know this angle is 15, so this angle is 15. So the component of t, so let me just draw it again. This is x direction, this is y direction and T is pointing like that at 15 degree, right? So the component of T along X direction would be minus T cosine 15, and along Y would be minus T sine 15, right? Okay, so we have T cosine 15 pointing towards left. So we have T cosine 15 multiplied by the perpendicular distance. So perpendicular distance would be this, which is how much? This is whole length is L from here to here, and that's 30. So this would be L sine 30, perpendicular distance, right? Okay, so we got that. And the direction of this moment would be positive because this component is pointing towards this direction. So if you draw the circle with this as the tangent, the circle is going to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, and that's why this whole quantity is positive, right? For the same reason, if you look at the component of T along Y direction, which is T sine 15, this is going to give rise to a moment in the clockwise direction. And that's why this quantity is negative. So you add them together. Some quantities are positive, some quantities are negative, and you equate it to zero. You have one equation. Everything is known except for t. You solve for t. Right? OK, so the question is, what if I was interested in, let's say, the reaction at A? How would I solve for that? So I want to solve for a reaction at A, the reaction forces at A, Ax and Ay. Anyone? Any ideas? How can I solve for reaction at A? So one way we can solve for reaction at A is we can simply write sigma F equal to 0, right? So if I write sigma F equal to 0, what will I have? I will have acceleration forces AX. I'll have acceleration force from T, which is T cosine 15, but it's negative. So that's AX minus T cosine 15. 
and that should be equal to 0. Since t is just known, we know the Ax now. Then we can sum up the forces along the y direction. Forces along y direction are Ay, which is positive, Mg, which is negative, and T sine 15, which is negative. So we add them together, equated to 0. Since T is known, Mg is known, we can solve for Ay. So by using sigma f equal to 0, now I can solve for Ax and Ay. Right? I can also take the moment about point B and equate that to be 0. So if I take moment about point B, there will be no contribution from the, from the tension. There will be contribution from Mg, and there will be contribution from Ax and Ay. But that one equation alone won't let you solve for both Ax and Ay, right? Because you'll get only one equation, you have two unknowns. Then you have to take moment about another point. Then since you have to write two equations, why not just do sigma f equal to 0 and solve for the problem in one shot, right? Any questions about this? Well, that depends on the perpendicular distance, right? So the t cosine 15 is going this way. So I have to use this perpendicular distance. So let me erase this so that you can see it more clearly. So the component of t along horizontal direction, this is 15, is t cosine 15, right? that part you understand. So I'm looking for perpendicular distance to this line of action from point A. So how do I get that? I can extend this line and I can draw the perpendicular. So I'm looking for this distance, right, D, which is this. This angle is 30, this angle is 30. This whole length is L. So this has to be L sine 30, right? This is a right angle triangle. For t sine 15, which is pointing this way, the perpendicular distance is this, and that is L cosine 30. So I'm looking for the perpendicular distance to the line of action. And that, for that, you need to use a little bit of trigonometry and geometry to figure that out.